in the fire, we have Dr. Natalie West on. She's a carnivore uh, psychotherapist and uh, a, nutri a nutritional psychologist and nutritional psych a psychotherapist. And uh, how about you start with a brief description, with a brief explanation of how you got to into uh, the role of diet and uh, mental health. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, thank you too, by the way, and hello everybody that's watching. Um, so I am based in Melbourne, Australia, and I've been a, a clinical psychotherapist and um, training in this space now for over 16 years. But prior to that, I was in 20 years of corporate land. So I come from a background of senior sales management, operational management. So I kind of have an understanding of corporate space, but also too, I moved away from that because I really wanted to really make a difference in people's lives. And that's when I went down the path of studying and really long time ago, I also studied uh, clinical hypnotherapy to kind of get me on the path to uh, you know, psychotherapy, but also now competing a qualification in nutritional psychiatry. So one, one of the biggest things for me, um, even back 16 years ago, was the connection between our gut and our brain when it comes to mental health. So traditionally, if you're talking about a psychology model, no one generally asks you what you eat or, you know, what you're fueling your body with because technically I actually call our gut our first brain. So if we're not fueling ourselves correctly with our diet and the way we eat, we are going to suffer. So I really, really work in two main spaces. One, which is teaching people how their minds work and why they do what they do from a behavioural point, so consciously and unconsciously. And then I also ask them what they eat because negative self-image and a really bad diet will contribute to your mental, physical health. And what's people's re reaction to dietary interventions when you ask them about that? They're um, quite shocked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and you know, when I was I was doing this, like I said, you know, over 16 years ago now, and even asking those questions back then, it was very, very foreign, and you would get a little bit of pushback and a little bit of resistance um, because we've been typically told that, you know, if you have a mental health concern, whether it's depression or anxiety, it's all here, right? So we're just talking to this part of our head. It's not just in our head. It's in our whole body and including our gut. So people are pretty clear once they kind of know where I work and, you know, if they're going to reach out to me to have a consult, they, they do know that that's going to be a question. <laughs> hmm. um, and I, I think the main reason being is because most people have tried, you know, all different types of therapy and interventions. But, you know, if we're fueling our gut with sugar, hyper-processed, non-nutritional based foods we are really going to suffer mentally so yeah people are pretty aware when they come to me they're like i know what she's going to ask me <laughs> <laughs> probably the, uh, they get to know you uh, from their friends and my yeah. uh, imagination would be that you don't get any vegan patients do you so uh, the, um, I actually have worked with a few um, who have been vegan for quite some time, have very bad anxiety and depression, um, and have been really, really ill um, from removing animal-based nutrition from their from their diet. So it's, it's handful, um, but generally they rarely seek me out. <laughs> and uh, they want to stay vegan from no. what they understand? Yeah, they don't. Understand. No, it, you know, like I... I don't work in the vegan space because I will always say that it is it is a diet that will not sustain you long term and it is not good for your mental health. Um, it, and I also question the belief structure around, you know, being a vegetarian veganism when we know that the religious dogma and the propaganda behind, um, you know, cows are bad for the environment and all that, you know, hoo-ha. Um, we know that's not the truth. So I just kind of want to really allow people to understand, well, what's the belief behind that? Is that a real belief? Is it something you've heard? Let's just kind of do some research because sometimes 
being stuck in a dogma of a belief can actually harm you more than help you. So if you're, you know, concerned also about the fact that there's animal cruelty, which, you know, we all are, right, but the the message mainly is that veganism saves saves animals. It actually doesn't. You know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of animals die through any kind of way of eating. So it's just finding that balance for people to um, feel okay. But secondly, uh, I'll always state to people, you're living in your life, you're living in your body, and if you're not well and you're suffering mentally, is that worth it? Definitely, that's a great question to ask. Um, yeah, for example, if you want to make a change in the world, if you yourself are suffering, you cannot help the others. Uh, there is this uh, very maybe superficial saying that, or a superficial example, but I think it uh, has an importance here. Um, when we are on the plane, they say, okay, you, you need to put the mask on yourself first and then on the children or on the elderly right. first. You need to save your, yourself because if you are dead, you are good for no one if you are suffering. Correct. Are and one. that's that's also in daily life. You know, I see so many people who are just surviving, <clears throat> you know, energetically, mentally dragging themselves around, <clears throat> excuse me, every day. Um and that's not what humans are meant to be. We're meant to be thriving and we're meant to be bright and alive and alert. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, the food pyramid or the dietary advice that we're being given doesn't make us thrive at all. It actually does the opposite. True. And uh, that comes to me as a surprise when I listen to other, uh, to other interviews you've had when you describe the path that you took. With carnivore? It- uh, yeah, how, how how did you come across carnivore? Because we all have heard, of course, that we should eat all the plants and uh, eat the rainbow to be happy, to be thriving, <laughs> to have a healthy heart, healthy mind. Uh, how uh, come you came a- across a totally different path? And it was uh, long ago, uh, if I'm not Two mistaken, about how, how long ago? Two years ago. Oh, okay, that is more... Oh uh, yeah, digestible like kind, kind of. So, how come you came across this as the correct way to uh, to to fuel your mind? And yeah, so I was a bodybuilder for many many years. So I was, you know, typically eating three hours every, you know, sorry, eating every three hours and training very heavily and, um, you know, protein and 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 carbs depending on where I was in the training process and you know avocado for fat and things like that so I've come from a pretty much um what you would typically look at as a pretty healthy way of eating right um however I also haven't eaten fruit for over five years I don't eat wheat or gluten and I never did even before carnivore because I know what the protein element of the of the gluten does to your brain um you know, and most people when they eat it, they want to go to sleep. So it's telling you that there's something wrong there anyway. Um, so for me, um, just prior to COVID, um, I was always constantly hungry. So every single time I ate, I was like, oh, something's off here. I think I must, I'll just go get my bloods checked. And um, I, I thought it might have been an insulin resistance issue because of eating the way I had for so many years. Um, so yeah, I was right. So that came back as borderline type 2 diabetic, right? But I was 60 kilos. So, again, you look on the outside and you would think, you know, someone's really healthy, but on the inside there's some, there were some funky things going on. So um, I just went, hmm, okay, I think I know what I need to do. So I was just doing some research and then a little video came up because I'd never known who Paul Mason was, Dr. Paul Mason out of Sydney, who is just a rock star. I just so respect him for what he's doing in the community. Um, and I just started watching and I'm like, well, actually – I'll just give that a go for 30 days and just see how I go. And that was two years ago. So uh, after the first two weeks, once I have my gut adjusted, which everybody understands that if you've gone from even where I was, you know, I wasn't coming off a standard Australian diet or a standard American diet or anything like that. You still have gut adjustment with carbs coming down and, you know, fat going up. So um, it took me two weeks And then 
my brain just was like literally like a thousand light bulbs. Um, stopped being hungry, which was just amazing. Uh, stopped craving carbs. Um, you know, my asthma reversed, my insulin resistance reversed, uh, and so did my allergies. So that's just really, I was just amazed at how quickly it did it for me. But secondly, again, I think there's there, there is lessons in unlearning what you believe is true so you know in my even my own training in my past um you know there was elements of like you need your greens and all that kind of thing so I had to really dig deep and go actually hold on for some people that's not true and why is that not true um but again when I work with anyone but you they're an individual they're unique and some people can cope with a low carb with veggies some can't it really just depends on their gut health and if they're oxalate issues or they've got lectin issues. So for me, though, um, I'm zero plant. So I haven't eaten a plant for two two years, over two years, uh, and also carb, zero carb. So I get all of my nutrition and my energy from being fat adapted and using fat um, as my fuel and just animal-based nutrition and I've never felt better and my bloods are amazing and um yeah it's the best way to be human <laughs> it's what I call the you know species appropriate way of eating to be honest um and again you know when I'm working with people who've got depression or anxiety and they're living on carbohydrates and sugar it creates a very very chaotic space so if you're going to see a therapist and you're talking about, you know, you've got issues or whatever's going on for you at the point in time, but if you're fueling yourself with chaos, it's just like two ships passing in the night. You're never, ever going to get to the root cause, right? So I always come from a point of you either can choose chaos for your body, your brain and your body, or you can choose calm. And Animal-based nutrition and quality fats is the most calming thing you can do for your body and your brain. And I like the word, um, the phrase that he used, is some bodies can cope with those vegetables. So from what I understand, you also um, are convinced that they are not necessary, but we can, uh, so, some people, we are on different parts of the spectrum. Some of us can digest them and some of them some of us can't be and we are so much averse to them is that the yeah look i'll always come from two spaces so as human beings we have been programmed so a part of our self-image between you know the zero to seven so this is another area that i work in is really teaching people what your precognitive commitment is which is between the age of zero to seven by the time you are seven your beliefs and your value structures and your self-image has been developed by everyone in authority to you. So if you think about your head as a video camera or as a child, it's recording everything, whether or not it serves you or not. Okay, so anyone in authority to you between zero to seven, you learn from. Now, you want to hope that you have good teachers most of the time. But as we know, we don't have the ability to filter out. So analytically, we don't question as a child because we just don't have that ability, right? So we just literally, everything comes through our eyes, through our ears, through our mouth, and through our kinesthetic reactions. So we learn. We're also, as humans, we're energy, okay? So what that means is you get little mini snapshots as a child of everything around you that gets downloaded through your conscious into your unconscious as your self-image-based programs around relationships, yourself, self-respect, love, but generally they're all external. So if I just to take you through something right now, for anyone that's listening, if I get you to think about the word relationship, where does your mind travel to? Where's the first place it travels to? I think about another person. Correct. Because we've been programmed to think the relationships external are our first point of call. Guess what's the most important relationship that we should have? 
it's the one we left ourselves. ourselves. But we don't learn that. Okay, so we learn to validate through external. Make sense? Yeah. So when it comes to talking to people about their own uniqueness and their own programming, especially when it comes to food, because we are taught to use food as comfort. When we're emotional, we eat. When we're stressed, we eat. When we're sad, we eat. When we're happy, we eat. And especially depending on cultures, you know, I've got lots of people that I know that are Italian, right? So when you go there, eating for eight hours straight is normal, <laughs> you know? Mm. So it's like, you need to eat, you need to eat. And it's like, yeah, but I'm not hungry. So we lose our intuition to eat when we're actually hungry and to fuel ourselves the right way. So psychologically, when I'm working with people, I have to go, right, what is your attachment to food? What is food being used for you? So a lot of the time people will do things to themselves versus for themselves. So instead of eating around the emotion, I teach people to go through the emotion with the disconnection with food because food is the anchor, which then whenever you get a reaction or a feeling in your life that sounds or feels similar, guess what? You'll eat. So your mind is a pretty, it's a pretty amazing tool once you understand how it works, but it loves familiarity, right? So you need to help yourself to understand what's my programming why do I do the behaviors that I do why do I talk to myself the way that I do um and also do I know who I am because as I said the zero to seven cognitive commitment you know programming that we have our self-image and our belief structures and our value systems are not ours we learnt them now if you don't change them you will have them for the rest of your life, regardless if they serve you or not. And uh, how challenging is it to change them normally? I can see by introspection, I can see that some of these beliefs after years, I have realized that, yeah, because of maybe that incident, maybe that person I am, uh, I am acting or behaving so similar to that person who, who has been an authority in my life. And it has taken years for me to first realize that and changing them, how successful I've been changing in some of them, I really don't know. So how challenging is it and what what's the best way to go about it? Your mind is a pretty simple tool, to be honest, but we just have to understand that it's not too difficult, but it just operates in images, feelings and reactions. Okay, so when we, well, whenever I work with someone, it's about getting them inside their own pathway, getting inside their own head so they actually understand what is being communicated, what that looks like, what it sounds like and what it feels like. And most human beings, especially men, sadly, are not taught how to actually go through their emotions and to hold mm -hmm. their emotions. Generally, you get told to push them down, go around them. You, you can't go around them for the rest of your life. Well, you can, but you'll end up depressed and you'll end up really anxious and you won't actually know who you really are. So I can actually work through with people very quickly and most people will get a recognition within the first two hours of working with me because what happens is the tools and the techniques that I use is for people to actually become very in tune with, oh, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's actually not mine. It was someone else's belief structure or value system that's driving my behaviour. So, again, value systems are driven by energy and emotional content. So the highest emotional content that you have received as a child around an event, a person, a situation, doesn't really matter what it is, the higher the emotional content, the more that that will drive your behaviour, whether or not it's good for you or not. Because your conscious mind is the only one that can intervene and go, do I want dinner today? The light's red. What song do I want to listen to, right? Whereas your unconscious is operating on autopilot 90% of your day. It's running your beliefs and your values and all of your programming all day, every day.
until you intervene and go, hold on. And the best analogy I can give you for this is when people say to me, why do I keep doing the same thing over and over and over when I know it's not good for me? But guess what? I keep doing it. The reason for that is because the unconscious part of your self-image, 90% of the behavior is driven by that. So consciously you can try and make a change unless there's an agreement or a shift in your unconscious programming, it will never happen, ever. That's why when we talk about people say, oh, positive thinking, it doesn't work. Well, you've got two choices here. As a child, for example, when a baby, right, a baby starts to walk. What happens when a baby walks and then they fall over and then they get up and they fall over? They don't say, damn it, I'm not going to walk anymore, right? So what they're doing, they're building a neural pathway of strength to be able to get up and walk. So that becomes familiar, right? We do exactly the same thing with our thoughts and our feelings and our reactions. So we can build a negative neural pathway with our brain that becomes familiar, even if it's not serving us. So that's why your brain is very simple. It's just waiting for your instruction and the data to where it wants you to go. But if you're operating on a very negative and poor self-image, which most human beings are, that needs to change. We need to get you from a negative self-image to start operating out of a positive self-image. So again, the minute that you have the awareness of how you've conditioned yourself to basically stay in that negative neural pathway, both mentally and physically, The minute you start to change track to go, well, hold on, if I can say these things about myself that are negative, that make me feel comfortable, sadly, what can I do for myself to start building a new neural pathway that makes me feel good, that serves me, that works for me, that helps me, right? Now, in the beginning, when we start to do that, the energy of that reaction is very small right? Because you haven't built it up. So what normally happens is your mind will go, oh, that's unfamiliar and it's not really working because it's really tiny. I'll go back over here and I'll stick with the neural pathway that I've built for 30 or 40 years, even though I know it feels bad, but it becomes familiar. So it's moving into or from unfamiliarity into familiarity but you can make anything unfamiliar familiar. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it takes conscious effort, and we should get used to the fact that it, in the beginning it will take time and energy because we want to go to the path that we are most used to and we know the best. Well, correct, and our minds will always, it's designed to either stay in the past or to go out into the future, which looks blank. For most people now if you don't have mm-hmm. a very clear vision of who you are first everything from your past is going to come back round in front of you so really it's just going to be a repeat of everything that you've experienced so when people actually understand and create gaps and spaces in their awareness so they wake that kind of unconscious part up most of the time you realize you're living every day in the past So I'll give you an idea. So if I asked you when you went to bed at night, what's the thought and feelings that you've got going on in your head before you go to sleep? How I spent my day, which is past. Correct. And normally most people will pick out the negative neural pathway of I'm stressed, I'm worried, all of these things about, you know, I had a bad day, I had an argument with my boss or a customer didn't do something. So that's past. So we're actually, your mind, so again, we're retraining our mind here, you're going to sleep in the past. Now, first thing when you wake up in the morning, again, what's the first thought normally we have when we wake up? What did they dream about? Or most people other than that, they go, oh, my God, it's Monday. Ugh. So then they're already averted back to a bad feeling of the day before. Mm-hmm. 
the so we've conditioned one, yeah. ourselves to stay in the past. So we've started our day already in the past. And yeah. that's what most people do. So I interrupt that pattern for them to help them become very present because the other thing is, especially also too, when it comes to developing a future that you want, okay, you can't do that when you're in the past all the time. You've got to be present. And what's the role of future here? So future will depend on what that is for each individual person's mind. So remember, every single person will perceive and present differently. Okay. But most of the time, our minds naturally, when I use the word future, will just jump out and generally it'll be career, relationships, house, car, tick, 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 all those things, right? But from my space where I work, that has nothing to do with it. It's part of it, but we must understand what our purpose and our vision is for ourselves right now to be able to create that desire that we want in the future. Okay, you cannot create anything in the future if you don't know who you are and if you're operating from a negative self-image and you're also fueling yourself with really bad food, you're just going to keep bouncing back, forward, back, forward, and that's extremely exhausting. <laughs> yeah, and the role of food here is really important and I remember from your other, other interview to, to be present, to be not subject to um, huge ups and downs uh, a sustained um, energy is really the key and when you also were describing the uh, some minutes ago about how uh, there were light bulbs in your brain that <laughs> uh, went on after you changed your nutrition that was the case for me too and that was what kept me on this diet and everyone says that oh you, you have uh, lost your weight and I am saying that that is not the point anymore it, I, I am more comfortable like this right. and for, uh, for example something like ADHD had become a part of my per personality because I could see that my uh, family on my paternal side uh, were prone to, th to this mm -hmm. and I had come to believe that it is the way that I should keep on living and I have mm -hmm. to accept it but I realized that, well, there is a different way of living. I don't have to forget things all the time. I don't have to forget my words all the time. Uh, absolutely. And I, I get, you know, messages every, every day from people who have, like just one this week, she's in Russia and, you know, she's had severe, severe mental disorders for 15 years of her life and nothing worked and no one ever asked her what she was eating. So she, you know, took took her health and her mental and physical health into her own hands and went carnivore. And, you know, her her shift and change has been phenomenal. But, you know, she did that on her own because she'd had enough. And And that's the other thing, you know, I think we've been so marketed to and the dogma and the propaganda. And, again, I'll say to people, you know, carnivore, if you speak to any long-term carnivore, ask them how they feel. It will be worlds away from what they used to feel, but also, too, most of them have so much energy. They don't look their age. They kind of, like, reverse age backwards. It, it's phenomenal. But I always talk in the context of any dietary, you know, information. It's all got to come back to mental health and physical health and what we're actually doing to ourselves versus for us, Right. So, again, like we said earlier, I have some people that are on a low-carb diet and that works for them, but also it's the psychological attachment with them letting go of bread or letting go mm. of carbohydrates because we're also told that our brain needs carbs to survive. It, it doesn't. It does. And carbs, as in refined flour, sugars, even fructose for some people, um, is very, very toxic. For people yeah and it doesn't serve you you don't need it um, because your brain has two ways of working right either from glucose or from fat ketones 
right? So when you have no carbohydrates in your body, your body's automatically going to create ketones and start using the fat for fuel out of your cell. So if you, like, again, if you go back and speak to anyone that's moved from a really high carb sugary diet into either in a low carb or a carnivore, one thing that they will tell you, their brain was just like, it was like, and as you know, you would have experienced that yourself, but your, your energy is stable. You don't have ups and downs of cravings or sugar highs and lows. You sleep better. Um, and again, when your body is calm and you're nourishing your body, your thinking follows. Yeah. So then we've just got to make sure that you're also moving out of that negative neural pathway with thinking who you think you are or, you know, based on other people's thoughts, feelings and reactions of you. That kind of also helps you move a lot easier into the positive space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh regarding uh, the sustained energy and uh, brains running on uh, carbohydrates all the time. Uh, unfortunately, we also get uh, negative advice and sometimes we don't have the problem. I mean, most of the times we don't have the problem of um, bad patients who don't follow the guidelines of the doctors. It is uh, yeah. not that. It is actually bad information, for example, bad advice. Uh, after I had, I was already uh, in keto and I had started keto diet, um, I saw a video on ADHD and, and there was a doctor and he was talking about the importance of sugar that uh, ADHD people need to have a sustained uh, um, supply of sugar so it's good to have some juice with you all the time to just sip on it mm. I was like no just, what? <laughs> no <laughs> that's absolutely BS and that doesn't work it didn't work for me and actually getting away from that was it worked what for you worked for me yeah and and that's one thing that I really try to empower you know my clients with or anyone who follows me is to really you know Take control of your health, okay? Um, if something feels off, trust it, but also to just don't listen to the verbatim of most GPs because I know here in Australia, you know, most GPs should not be giving out nutritional advice because they're not even qualified in nutrition. They do them about six hours in six years, right? right? But again, we've also got the plant-based agenda that everyone's kind of on the bandwagon and, and I'm like, well, Meat's been around for quite some time and we wouldn't have evolved into who we are. And I know Dr. Chafee talks about this a lot, but meat is one of the most, you know, powerful parts of a, a human species way of eating. Um, and it's not by accident that, you know, especially red meat has the nine perfect amino acids in it, right? So when I talk about even, say, serotonin, so most people that are listening may have heard of serotonin and you know, if you're depressed, they tell you that, you know, you've got a chemical imbalance in your brain. Now, that's been debunked pretty long time ago. But secondly, there's no test for that, right? So that was actually also linked back to pharmaceutical companies developing that little story. Because, again, with an SSRI pickup, right, or depending, there's a couple of them. But um, the serotonin is made in your gut, <laughs> as you know, right? So 97% of it is made in your gut. So if you're eating high sugar, no nutrients, high fructose diet, guess what's happening to your serotonin? You're not going to make any because all of that food or food-like substance doesn't have any of the amino acids that we need to, you know, to turn that amino acid into that neurotransmitter. And I always say to people, you know, have you ever actually thought about how your body works? Like, do you just take advantage that your brain's just going to work automatically for you? Well, it does, thank God, because otherwise you wouldn't be alive because it keeps you breathing. But consciously, what do you actually look at every day when it comes to contributing to your own mental and physical health? And I'm especially not talking from this is really important any food or diet that most people are, have been susceptible to is always because it's about losing weight. Mm. It's always been a more of a punishment. You know, someone had gone a low-calorie diet, do this weird diet, 
then you end up starving, then you end up feeling worse and you just stay on this cycle, right? So we've got to really stop that and go, right, what is the most important thing that I need? I need my mental health and my physical health. How do I do that? I need to eat like a species. A lion is a species. It eats one lot of food. We are carnivores. That's where we have come from. We don't have four stomachs. We have one. So we also don't have, a lot of people don't have the ability to break down cellulose in the vegetables, right? And again, if people have oxalate issues or, again, if you eat a certain vegetable and you're not bloating, there's something going on there. Okay, so again, cravings aren't normal. Bloating's not normal. Huge amounts of gas is not normal. Um, but again, we've got to go, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Because again, the mental health connection between depression and anxiety and even long-term things like schizophrenia, and there is research now that being on a ketosis-based way of eating has literally reversed schizophrenic episodes in people. So to follow that work, um, go to Dr. Chris Palmer. He is a nutritional psychiatrist also in the US, brilliant human being. Um, he actually has a book out called Brain Energy. It's just on pre-order. But he basically talks about the fact that being in ketosis and being fat adapted um, literally has been helping his patients with schizophrenia, right? So every single person needs to understand, one, how they work, what food they're putting into their body and what it's doing. Yeah, and when we talk about nutrition, actually, and we are talking about losing weight, and nutrition yes. in that context is mostly starvation. And that is Correct. definitely not. Yeah, and that's why I always say to people, you know, when people come to me and they say, look, I've heard, you know, I could I could go on carnivore to lose weight. I'm like, well, that's the wrong pathway to start with because what you're doing psychologically, the minute that your brain has been programmed to think diet it's going to be alerted again and you're going to have the same things, yeah. right? So we've got to get past that. We've got to retrain the brain and your thinking to go, right, I need to eat a certain way for myself, for my lifestyle and to sustain what I need. So I always say that's a root cause. So let's go to the root cause. If you have depression or anxiety, let's look at your dietary patterns. Let's help you get into your positive self-image get you fueling yourself right, and guess what? Weight loss, once inflammation is repaired, so again, if your body, which most people's bodies are hugely inflamed uh, because of what they eat, um, we need to get that down first. So, you know, again, when people say to me, I've been on this diet, not, not the carnivore diet, but um, I've been on all these other diets and I cannot lose weight. I'm like, right, well, are you sleeping? And they're like, nope. I'm like, well, guess what? You won't lose weight. Because also cortisol response in your body, if you're not sleeping because you're eating rubbish, how do you think your body's trying to help you lose weight or help get you back to a sustainable weight for you, not a scale? If I have clients that have scales, I get them to throw them out because I'm like, you're not a number. We need to get you back into feeling amazing, mm. having your brain turned on, and guess what? You'll get out of your body's way. You won't, you won't kind of punish it anymore. And that's the other thing too. People don't like their bodies because they've been punishing them with food and restriction and not eating foods that satiate you, right? And yeah. I know some people that eat six times a day and they're still hungry and they're still crazy and they're not sleeping. And I'm like, mm. probably because you're not eating the right food. <laughs> Yeah, in there. All protein and fat, and you'll like fall in love with yourself. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I actually been there and also been there the state afterwards that I don't have to eat all the time and be hungry. Yeah. I, I sustain the energy and I love myself more, actually. You do, and, and it's quite funny for people to, because also as a society, we're told that we can't be hungry, right? It's like, oh, my God, I'm hungry. I've got to eat something. No, you don't. But if you're eating sugar all day and carbohydrates, you're going to be hungry because, in effect, you're not actually hungry. It's your body signals telling you you're starving. 
So mm. I always say to people, if you're shopping in the middle aisles of a supermarket, in most kind of Western, I don't know what your supermarkets look like, but yeah, um, exactly in like most, that. yep. If you're shopping in the middle aisles of the supermarket, you're overfed and you're undernourished. Yeah, once That's I, cool. yeah, once I had a podcast which was in Persian and I was imagining a supermarket yeah. and I realized that yeah, all the path that I am taking is around. It doesn't go to the center because all the rubbish right. is in the center. Correct. So if we go around the outside, and especially you know if you've got um, if you're on a low carb way of eating, it's just know what vegetables work for you and. Again, it is working with that psychological attachment to it's okay to let things go because the thing is the minute when you understand the emotional connection between the food, it's actually not about the food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just that's the anchor. So when we learn more about our own emotions and really getting in tune with ourselves, all of that drops away. You become more empowered. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was the, uh, the first time that I heard about this, uh, the link between serotonin and God. And in the beginning of this yeah. interview, you also said yep. that it's just not this, it's the whole not body. This, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it blew my, my mind and it made sense because my main problem, my biggest problem before um, starting keto or carnival was actually depression and long, long episodes of depression. Wow. And after becoming more animal based, which uh, when I was keto, I had only one episode of um, depression. They so needed to uh, take the pills and uh, take pills. And for me, it helped. For most of the people around me, I never see the pills doing any work. Maybe because my depression was not as hard and as deep as that. And Man, that was deep. So if something gets deeper than this, I wonder how they stay alive. Well, the other thing too that's really, really, really interesting is when you're living, say, on a glucose-based, you know, fuel for your brain mm -hmm. and you take antidepressants, again, every single person is different. But when you move down to a keto or into zero carb and you're operating on ketosis, when you take um, medication, you've got to be very, very careful because the uptake is going to be very different, right? Because your brain is operating on a different fuel source. And Chris Palmer talks about this in relation, and so does Dr. Georgia Ede. But when you have antidepressants and you start going keto or even into, say, you know, a carnivore, mm. your dosage changes because your body's not operating the same as what it was. So that makes perfect sense, okay? So to give you an idea, your body was operating differently prior once you're in ketosis and then if you're taking, you know, any type of drugs, to be honest, um, there is going to be a shift because the chemical structure in your brain is changed. So, you know, your body is operating on a different fuel source to what it was when you were given the tablets at the beginning. So... Again, depression, once you have, say, there's different types of terms that I'll use for it as well. So there's situational depression, there's body depression, there's self-image depression, and there's gut depression. So they're kind of the four parts that I use. Um, but all of the root causes of those come back to two main things, your diet and your own self-image about how you feel about yourself mm. and being concerned about what other people think. So that can give us depression as well. So, again, depression is going to mean many, many different things, but a lot of it is found in inflammation through what we yeah. eat and not feeling our gut. But when we have situational depression, we've just got to be really mindful, right? Because when we use a word, our minds are conducive by the energy of the word. So I tend to get my clients to say, well, is depression actually relevant in that situation or was it you were just annoyed mm -hmm. with what didn't go your way and that was okay or someone said something, you got upset, but was it really depression or was it just the fact that you're upset? So mm -hmm. it's really making sure because your mind listens all the time. 
it's waiting for the next information. It's waiting for the next command. So if you continue to use language that has a very low vibrational feeling to it from an emotional standpoint, you'll stay there. So I always get to people to say, like, you know, I have depression. It's like, no, 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 you've experienced depression. Mm -hmm. And again, it's about going, who am I without this? And that's a lot of the things that I have with my clients too. So they may have had depression or anxiety for 10 or 20 years and have been told that they will never, they'll just have to live with it, which to me just, it, it blows my mind that someone has been told that they need to live with it without getting in a dietary intervention and lifestyle intervention. So again, it's like, well, when you're talking to someone in that space and you're thinking about healing them out of it, it's quite scary because a lot of people don't know who they are without that. And as you would know, right, if you kind of think back in your memory bank of how you used to feel to how you feel now, I'll guarantee you, you never thought that was probably possible. No. no. But it's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you should also be really proud of yourself for, you know, going, no, I'm, I'm going to do something here and I'm going to do this and take the path, be uncomfortable because, you know, shifting from mm. a really high, you know, carby sugar diet is, it is uncomfortable. It is. But once you get there, you're like, whoo, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, yeah, for, first, uh, as we are still in uh, talking about depression, yeah, yeah. Uh, my life really needed to get a, a term for really the verse for me to take me down when I was in keto uh, ketosis. And the uh, interesting thing is that after, after that, when I changed to carnivore and it was a slow trend that I became carnivore by um, by the passage of the time. There has been time and there have been times that I've been sad and as you explained, it was appropriate to the situation because of what had happened. Your you know, stuff. when we talk about the serotonin, the mood stabilizers and, you know, for serotonin to be produced, we also need tryptophan. So tryptophan also comes in meat, right? Mm -hmm. So tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin to be made. So, and then we've got dopamine and we've got all the other, you know, neurotransmitters that actually dopamine fires in your brain when you eat sugar. Okay. So again, sugar turns on your brain to crave and to, you know, go into a state of what I call chaos. Fat turns that off. So if you're fueling your gut, with the right amino acids through an animal-based nutrition, a few veggies in there if you can, no problem, right? It just depends on each person. But it's about how you feel after you eat them. So, mm -hmm. again, if you're doing that and you feel your mood's really stable and you feel really great, brilliant. It's telling you you're fueling your neurotransmitters correctly. Now, it depends on the health of your gut as well. So if you've come from a really high wheat gluten kind of diet and you've got a leaky gut that may be a different kind of you know avenue that you need to travel to heal that but every single person on the planet needs amino acids tryptophan to convert into serotonin to help you mood and stabilize right um if you don't have that it's no wonder if we look at society right now we have so much depression and mental health issues the thing is, is what you were just saying, when you fuel your gut properly, your brain feels good, you feel energetically good. Now, if something happens that makes you feel sad, that's just the situation that's made you feel sad. So what we need to do is to not label it with I'm feeling depressed. You're not. You're just sad because you've had something happen, which is great. You have an awareness of that, but go through it. Don't go around it mm -hmm. so i always get a lot of my to journal journal the feeling get it out on paper don't care if it doesn't make sense but the more that you do that the more you're in then in reflection of guess what i've just validated myself if you don't validate your feelings that's also a really slippery slope but you've supported yourself with an amazing way of eating 
and then you don't have those big hills and valleys to go out of. You're just more conscious around an event has happened. Mm -hmm. Train yourself to be conscious in that event. So don't, so your brain also, your mind will literally link it back to either something that sounds like familiar to something that else has happened in the past, but we don't need that. We don't need it to kind of go through your filing cabinets and go, oh, this happened a little while ago too. This looks like the same thing. It's not the same thing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And the point that you raised about journaling, uh, I yes. am surprised by its power, really. Um, yeah. In many difficult, in, in some of the in difficult situations that I have uh, faced, I had some thoughts and I was thinking them, I, I, I was moving those thoughts around my head all the time. I just got them on, on paper and just they, they stabilized as if the paper just was a frame that held them. Yeah. I really don't know how does that work? Well, well, what happens is, so it's the process of instead of being in your thoughts and owning them, because we don't need to own them all, right? We just got to go, I have all these things going on in my head and I feel bad. So really it's about getting them outside of yourself so you're actually looking at them instead of being in them, okay? So a really, really good practice, and this helps people become very conscious, even once you've got the hang of it for a while, this helps you be very conscious every single day so you know exactly where your mind travels to and you know how to bring it back. So every night, sometimes morning, it depends on the person, but I just get them to feel when they're right. Sitting in stillness for a minimum of a minute, at least sometimes up to 10 to 15 minutes. So no, no music, just sitting in stillness, allowing your thoughts to be waves, but pushing them outside of yourself. So you're not in them, mm -hmm. you're just watching them and listening to them or whatever, right? Or whoever's voice it is. And what you do, the minute that your mind starts to wander and it starts to take you away either to the past or to the future or you feel a familiar feeling about yourself, right, which we all know what that is, I always get people to say, and now. Hmm. And now can't take you anywhere but now. <laughs> so and now disrupts that drag away. It takes you back inside yourself to reconnect back into your stillness so you're breathing and your heart space and just allow them to come and go again but don't grab onto them don't need to take them in right but and now is one of the most powerful processes you can do because what it does it gives you a clean slate to redirect yeah once there was a meditation uh, session it was long before uh COVID. And it was a Buddhist uh, wow. temple here. And they had the same uh, approach that you should observe them. And, yes. and it was a very, it, it was a new thing to me because all the time I had heard that in meditation, you shouldn't be thinking. But it was ah, like, the, let yeah. the thoughts come in and just watch them. Hmm. And that was a beautiful thing. Well, it, it is, and a lot of people think, you know, when I speak to people about meditation, they're like, oh, I've done it, I can't do it. I'm like, whoa, okay. So then that's a reflection back to their own, um, you know, doubt in themselves or they might get it wrong or there might be a bit of perfectionism going on there. So a lot of it is just about, you know, and we don't, we don't sit with ourselves. This is the problem, right? We're always go, 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 but we've got to stop. Mm -hmm. We have to sit and but. We don't have to be in our thoughts. Stillness and that and now process is one of the, my clients love it. They're just like, I even use it during the day when I'm starting to kind of wander backwards or something triggers me. They're like, and now, and they're like, oh, cool. I'm redirected back to what I need to do in that gap. So it's like it's creating the gaps between those neural pathways of being unconscious in your autopilot mode, which your mind's going, oh, we'll go back here because it's safer and familiar. But when you use and now, it brings you into that consciousness so you can make a decision in the moment. The more that you do that, you more then your unconscious becomes you are the driver of your unconscious instead of the other way around. 
Yeah, so, uh, something related to the other parts of our uh, conversation. Yeah, actually, there are uh, about uh, some questions that are, I mean, uh, we have gotten far away from them, but uh, and they are worth uh, some attention. Uh, well, one of them is, I also remember that in, I think it was the interview with uh, Sarah Kleiner, in which you said that you cannot talk to a starving brain. I have really seen that. I don't know how I got into keto when I when my brain was starving. <laughs> it was, um, I mean, how did the information make sense to me? I really don't know. How do you make the message understandable for someone who is uh, who is starving? Actually, they are eating all the time, maybe, but mm -hmm. they are still starving. How do you make the message deliverable? Because I have tried so many times to reach people who had same experiences as me or experiencing the same things that I have been through, but I really cannot communicate to them. Uh, well, a lot of it is there's, there's a, a couple of ways. So again, um, the perception or through the psychology modeling and the medical modeling that, you know, your gut has nothing to do with your mental health, right? And that's what people get told. So, you know, we need a rainbow diet, we need this. And it's like, well, no, because if someone's been doing that for 10 or 20 years and they're still in the same position, that doesn't really make sense to me, right? So you're going to go, well, there's got to be an intervention of shift of somewhere because, again, at the end of the day, your gut needs amino acids. Your gut needs to convert neurotransmitters. Now, if you're not actually looking at the food that they're eating for that to happen, yeah, your brain's starving. So if you're going and doing talk therapy or CBT therapy, um, you know, all the time with someone, but then they're getting in their car and they're filling themselves with a bottle of Coke and a donut, like, I, I don't know why that doesn't, you know, is, is being ignored continually. But, you know, I know collectively with myself and my colleagues and, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all pushing, you know, th this message and, you know, people like Michaela Peterson, you know, lots and lots of people that are out there that are doing this. But, again, it comes back to the individual person and their value systems of self. So, again, if I go back to the zero to seven, most human beings are not taught how to self-respect. We're not. We use food as punishment. We, we punish ourselves all the time. Then we get into the psychological chatter and negativity about who we are and we're not good enough and, you know, we're not, we don't, most human beings do not love themselves unconditionally, okay, so, or let alone even just love themselves. And that also is a representation of what people eat. So if you see someone with a high value of themselves and then you watch what they eat, they don't eat rubbish, they don't eat sugar. And, you know, some people don't even eat fruit, like myself. I don't like it. It's sweet and disgusting. Um, but, again, it, it's about people being ready, going mm. back to the connection of are my anxiety, what is it contributing to, well, food is a contributing factor, Someone's got to be ready to go, you know what, I need to take ownership of this. Some people don't want to, and that's okay. That's their journey. But for people that kind of find me, they're, they're at their threshold. They're like, I'm done. I, I, I can't live like this anymore. I need to do something. But it's not just me, right? They've been seeing things for months and months and months and months, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, I've seen this 20 times in the last month. I think I need to pay attention. Um and I always say to people, don't ever discount what arrives in front of you. Look at it. If it makes sense and there's a little bit of energy reaction in your body, follow it because it may lead you to a whole new way of being. To your, uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I wonder, have you watched The Sopranos, the TV series? I haven't actually, no. I've never watched it. <laughs> Everyone's yeah. going to be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and why I'm bringing that up is that, well, the main character goes to a psychoanalyst and um, actually it's like a therapist probably because they mm -hmm. prescribe him some medications for panic attacks. And I am always asking myself because I started it, uh, I started watching it when I was already in the car, uh, in carnivore. Yeah. 
why is he drinking coffee? Why is he drinking alcohol all the time? Why is he uh, eating the same food? And that question never comes up, even uh, with coffee that is known for so so many people. It, it works as a kind of trigger. For me, it does. Yeah. That it triggers me and it makes me jittery. Yeah. And he goes through panic attacks and he has his coffee and that is just something that they do. And that question never comes up. Well, it, it's funny you talk about that because coffee, again, um, you know, some people, depending on how you're, so you've got a crib cycle in your body and it depends on how, so if you drink caffeine, your body is taking the caffeine and then it, regu- you know, regulates it and then lets it go out of the body in certain processes. But a lot of people can't do that. Mm-hmm. So lot, like, I, it's funny, I had just had a client this morning, we are talking about the exact same thing. So when he drinks coffee, he gets hot and he gets jittery. So it's like, well, that's telling you that your body's not releasing it. Whereas for someone like me, I can drink coffee. I only have one a day. It doesn't really do anything for me. It just, I just like the taste of it with my double cream, but that's about it, right? So again, it's really getting in tune with each individual person's, you know, body. And the other thing is, is when you're eating a really bad way of, you know, a diet of sugar and carbs and, you know, refined flours and all those things, you actually don't know what your body's doing. (laughs) <laughs> because you can't feel or notice any of the signals because you're just dumping all this toxic rubbish into your body. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you'll find too, the more that you are into that carnivore, even into you know low carb, your awareness around your body and your signals become very clear. You know when to eat, you know when to stop, you know what your body wants and you feed it and that's it. So again, it's the hunger hormone as well. Um, that gets really, really messed up when you're eating, um, you know, a, a really bad diet because you're always hungry and you're always craving sugar. Um, you know, I've, I've, it's very rare I hear a carnivore say, hmm, when was the last time I craved something? They don't. But what they do do, your body will actually tell you what fatty food you need to eat. Have you experienced that? Yeah. Last yeah. Last yesterday. <laughs> Yeah. So for example, I had a lady actually message me last week. She was like, oh, I don't get cravings anymore, but I'm more drawn towards ribeye than I would salmon sometimes. I'm like, well, that's your body telling you that that's a more of a high fat source that you need. And other times it may draw you towards salmon or fish or whatever, but that's a very different response to being chaotic versus calm. So yeah yeah so one of the other issues that you uh, you raised here was about gluten that you haven't been eating that because you were aware of the effects of gluten on your brain Uh, could you also uh, talk about that so basically um gluten and wheat so wheat is not what it was you know back in our Mm -hmm. grandparents generation right it's highly toxic it's sprayed with you know, so many chemicals, especially um, glyphosate in, in a lot of um, in a lot of countries, uh, which is technically clear like Roundup. <laughs> so we don't want to be eating that. Um, and it's highly processed. There's no nutrients in it. But also, too, you'll probably find with anyone that eats gluten, um, bread, anything that's got it in it, um, you become very sleepy. You become bloated. You can also end up in the toilet. You can also end up with like little lumps on the back of your arms, which is actually an inflammation response. So, the gladiin um, in the gluten, um, sorry, in the in the protein molecule, um, actually affects your brain. So, there's actually been studies shown that it actually slows down parts of your brain, but it also can actually make you quite angry. It can make you quite uh, short-tempered, but again, it depends on the chemistry of each person. So, again, it's the signals from the gut. Gluten is one of the worst things you can eat for your gut. Terrible, 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 terrible. Um, I highly suggest anyone, if they're going to start with anything, get rid of that. Mm-hmm. It's just, a, look, I know sourdough tastes great, but uh, it's really not good for you. From a mental health point, remember. So, again, some people can eat it and feel fine. But then, again, if I say, check, you know, check on the back of your arms, you may have a few little lumps. Like they're really like, like chicken skin little kind of lumps. Um, that tells you that they're, you're inflamed. So as a kid, I used to have them. And my doctor and my mum put it down to eczema. Now, as I got older and I got rid of the wheat and the gluten, 
they disappeared. And I did a little test many, many, many years ago. I thought, right, I'm going to go off it and see what happens. And I'm going to eat it again and see what happens. And they came back. So, yeah. So my kids are the same. Um, they eat if they go out with their mates or whatever and they eat and I'll have them. And then I'm like, well, you need to go off it. <laughs> so, mm. you know, my kids are teenagers, so it's it's very rare that mum can actually tell them, you know, please don't eat that. <laughs> But they have to experience it for themselves as well. Yeah, yeah. That's when the pieces yeah. fall into place. Yeah. Mm, and a non-carnivore question, you also talked about mm -hmm. your uh, background in hypnotherapy. How, effect, how effective of a tool is hypnotism uh, in your practice? So long, long time ago, I would use kind of the traditional methods of hypnotherapy, but I don't tend to anymore. I use more of an open eye technique so people can actually understand, you know, when they're actually hypnotized themselves because most people are actually in a waking state of hypnosis every day, every day. So we're asleep, right? We're hypnotizing ourselves with the same food, same sounds, same smells. Everything's the same. Get out of bed on the same time. Just think the same thoughts. So we're hypnotizing ourselves all the time. And again, once you're not conscious of that, your unconscious takes over and we'll just run those programs around your own self-image. So for me, as I said, open eye technique, I teach people the process so that they actually understand what they're doing. So once people have stopped working with me, they have those tools for life. They totally know how to get themselves back into the present moment. They understand like if they went back somewhere, they don't get attached there and they don't stay there. They go, oh but the emotional reaction is gone. Yeah. So I've, I've changed my way of treating um, over the last couple of years in that. So I, I just find the visual um, eye-open technique works brilliantly. Cool. Uh, um, I think that would be, I want to be respectful of the time. I think that would be the yep. last question I'm yep. going to yep, uh, raise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so how easily do your clients uh, follow your advice? How uh, easy do they? How, how easily is it uh, how easy is it for them to make changes and stick to the procedure to, to their uh, dietary intervention and how successful are they? Yeah, look, I have a pretty high compliance with my clients because you know I'm very, very clear at the front when I speak to people. It's like, Working with me is not easy, okay? So you will go through some very uncomfortable situations, but you are being held in a safe space and we have a trust that we're both in mutual trust that I'm getting you the results that you have asked for and that you need. But also, too, a lot of my clients experience whole new shifts of things that they didn't experience just purely because I know when I'm working with someone, if I see a re reaction or response, I know where to follow it. I know what they need to get them to that next step. Um, so a lot of my clients always say to me, I was just thinking that in my head and you've just said it out loud and how did you know that? I'm like, well, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> but compliance is is pretty good. Like my clients, you know, I, I work with people anywhere from a 12 week to six months to a year. Uh, again, depending on who they are and what they need and what they require. Um, at the end of every 12 weeks, like I've had many testimonials, even after working with people for a month, um, you know, one gentleman that comes into my mind, he was quite suicidal about six, uh, six months ago. Um, after working with me for six weeks, he said it's the first time that he'd ever woken up without feeling depressed and actually feeling like he had a, a chance at his future and he just felt really good about himself. So, again, it's very clear in the beginning that, we're going to take the layers off and we're just really going to dig deep because I really want people to understand that self-image negative and the way you eat is fueling your behaviours. So give people the tools to understand that and really it's about empowering them to take their health and their mental and their physical health back into their own hands. And honestly, when I see people do that, it's just lights me up like it, it, when when that light bulb goes off for them when they realize they're not broken and there's nothing wrong with them they just don't understand what's going on um yeah it's 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 amazing great and um 
before we say goodbye, uh, yeah. how can people follow your stuff? Follow your sure. Book? So uh, on Instagram, so it's natalie.ewest and uh, it's www.natalieewest.com. But um, I think you've got my details um, that you can pop in the show notes anyway. Um, yeah, you can find me on your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, that, that's mainly there. And also, too, I do offer um, a 30-minute free uh, introduction consult just to have a chat um, so if there's anything that anyone's heard on this podcast or any others, um, yeah, we can have a chat and, and uh, see where everyone's at. Great. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank and, you. No, yeah. it's been amazing. Thank you. An, yeah. an amazing job you've done too on your own journey. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for t- your time and hope we can uh, talk in, in the future Absolutely. too. And have a great day. Bye. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Around the Fire. If you are watching this video on YouTube, please give it a like and hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave the five-star review. It would cost you nothing but help me a great deal, especially if you do so on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you feel particularly generous, consider supporting me via Patreon, PayPal, or Bitcoin.